Welcome everyone to today's webcast. Nice to have all of you uh, tuning in for aligning security solutions and capabilities with the MITRE ATT&CK framework. Uh, MITRE ATT&CK framework, of course, is a hot topic. A lot of people are talking about it. We've got an interesting take uh, on it, as well as some awesome information on making it practical um, with Logarithm. Uh, here with me today from the Security Weekly side is our CEO, Matt Alderman. Matt, welcome. Thank you. I came back for Italy just for this webcast. That's awesome. That's awesome. Your internet's doing a lot better. That's great. Uh, we also have with us on the lines remotely, Dan Kaiser. He's a threat researcher for Logarithm. Welcome, Dan. Hello. Thank you. And next to him is Brian Coulson. He's a threat research senior engineer. Welcome, Brian. Hello. Nice to have you both uh, with us today for this program. Uh, just a quick agenda. We're going to go through the security failures of the Empire in Rogue One. My youngest son is uh, quite the Star Wars fan, which is awesome for me because I'm a Star Wars fan and the movies are on pretty much all the time, much to my wife's chagrin. Uh, and we were watching Rogue One and I thought it was uh, a really good story to uh, talk about and help ta tell the other story about the MITRE ATT&CK framework. So we're going to map some of those failures uh, of the Empire specifically in Rogue One to uh, items uh, in the MITRE ATT&CK framework. Now, if you haven't seen Rogue One, there may be some spoilers uh, involved. So I don't know how you as the listener want to handle that situation. Um, if you, you don't mind spoilers, that's fine. If you've seen it, great. Uh, if you've seen it multiple times, even better. Uh, but if you haven't seen it, might be some spoilers. Uh, then we'll transition to a logarithm to talk about detecting items in the MITRE ATT&CK framework using Logarithm's solution. So let's jump right into it. I am, in fact, a Star Wars fan. Now, as many of you know, there are different levels of Star Wars fan. Larry, of course, has the, you know, the tattoos. Kevin Johnson is in the 501st, so he's like super elite level Star Wars fan, much like the gentleman in this, in this picture. I'm more of like the Star Wars fan on the left, so I guess this slide is like what type of Star Wars fan are you like can you name five planets or moons and does alderaan count or not i mean it was a planet in any case while you're thinking about that maybe type in uh five planets or moons into the chat just for fun uh i am not at the level of the gentleman on the right uh of the slide i do have star wars trinkets but nowhere to that extent and i i don't dress up necessarily to go to the movie so just putting that out there level of star wars fan uh that i am Matt, where do you fall on the, the spectrum of Star Wars I, I, fan? I, I'm on the left with you. I, okay. I love the movies, but right. you know, I, I can't go that deep. Yes. I, and there's a, a lot to be said about the Star Wars. Uh, really, the whole universe is really interesting. And one of the things that I gleaned recently is in the movie Rogue One, there are some really interesting examples of failures that the Empire has made. Now, these are obviously failures that tie into a lot of other movies in the Star Wars genre. Uh, those of you may be familiar with the thermal exhaust port, of course. Uh, this is the movie leading up to that. And now what's interesting uh, about Rogue One, you know, just a little backstory, right? Like, so it came from that one line uh, in the Star Wars Episode IV, uh, A New Hope, where they basically say, you know, a lot of people lost their lives getting the plans to the Death Star. This whole movie is really around that. What I also quickly want to say about Rogue One is it's not a George Lucas film. It's not, doesn't feel like a space opera, right? It feels more like a much well, more well-written, well-scripted movie than some of the other Star Wars movies, as we can all talk about ridiculous lines like liking or not liking sand as an example. Uh, much more well-written, I think, which is why it took me, I think, a little time to warm up to it because it wasn't in that space opera uh, kind of format. Yeah, I'm sure there, was, there are those who disagree, agree, and anywhere in between, because you'll find all of those types of fans in Star Wars love to catch up with you at a conference and talk about Star Wars. But let's start with the first security lesson in the movie, uh, in Rogue One, they steal a ship, right? So essentially they're on a planet, uh, and we'll go into the whole backstory, but they end up stealing on a particular planet, not the one that they're going to go to, um, but they steal uh, an empire, one of the Empire ships, right? Um, and the pilot actually is uh, uh, an insider who's turned, right? He was a, a pilot for the Empire. Now he's working uh, 
uh, as a rebel. And the droid in this movie, K2SO, has the best lines, uh, like in the whole movie. Uh, arguably some of the smartest and wittiest lines uh, in all the Star Wars movies. And he says, you know, well done, you're a rebel now. That's Bodhi Rook uh, after he turned the weapons on, on the Stormtrooper. So they steal a Zeta-class cargo shuttle. This ship's computer now, so where they go after they, well, they steal the ship, they go to another planet, and they head to basically where the archives or the backup facility is, and there's a big firewall around it. We'll get to that. But they're on this ship, and the ship has codes to unlock basically the firewall or the shield around the planet that contains all of the Empire's backups, right? This is one thing that really warmed me up to the movie was I was talking to Kevin Johnson, arguably the biggest Star Wars fan that I personally know. He said, I like Rogue One because essentially they steal the backup tapes to accomplish their mission of exfiltrating data and getting the data that they need. Now, what I thought was interesting about, they're on this uh, Empire ship and they need an access code. So they basically steal it from memory. And uh, those listening, right, you kind of know where this is going. We all know tried and true methods about pulling passwords out of memory. And what was interesting to me was that password was in the movie, very valid. Um, and they reused that password to gain access to another resource that they didn't have access to before, which is essentially lateral movement in the security context uh, in a nutshell. So the planet they're going to is called Scarif. Uh, on this Empire ship. Now, when I look at the MITRE ATT&CK framework, I came up with, and we'll set the stage in MITRE ATT&CK uh, a little later, but essentially there's a, a, a whole matrix of different types of attack techniques. T1003 is credential dumping from memory. There's lots of different ways in which to dump credentials from memory, which is essentially what the Rebels did when they stole the Zeta-class starship, right? Um, and there is a script provided um, from the Empire Project in PowerShell that's essentially mim Mimikatz in PowerShell, right? Uh, and then if you have that, you can use uh, Atomic Red Team, which is where I pulled a lot of these uh, examples from, to then download and execute that script that comes from uh, the Atomic Red Team. And the reference is there. Now, much has been, we all know about Mimikatz, right? We all know about the detections, preventions, and, and things like that. The MITRE ATT&CK framework gives you a way to reliably test that. Um, and also, by the way, is one of those Windows air quotes vulnerabilities. It's really kind of the way Windows works as well that I think should be tops on your list, not only if you're the Empire, but if you're running an enterprise, this is something you're going to want to uh, address. Um, anyone want to disagree with me on, on that one, right? We got to address credential dumping from memory, right? No, absolutely, yeah. So uh, again, you can use these scripts to go test that on your system. And that's very much what Atomic Red Team seemed like to me. Now, there's a lot of other uh, advanced tools and different tools in uh, open source and commercial that allow you to test your environment against conditions such as credential dumping. Um, and this is just one way to accomplish that. It is, it is very manual uh, process. This is also something that, you know, you want to look for in your environment if someone's executing this style attack. And of course, you can read more about this. I also like to think about where you would start with the MITRE ATT&CK framework. Uh, do you guys remember like how many different uh, 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 attack techniques are in the framework today? It's, it's got to be over a couple hundred, right? There's a yeah, lot. I think, I think there's 244 techniques right now. Yeah. So you like my question was putting myself in the shoes of those defending an enterprise. Where do I start? Right. This to me, not just for the empire, but for you is probably a pretty good starting place, right? To look at uh, where the exposures are uh, in your network. Okay, impersonation plays a big role, not just in the Rogue One Star Wars story, right? But also in the original Star Wars movie, of course. You may remember they dressed up as, as stormtroopers, right? Very much the same thing is happening uh, in Rogue One. They impersonate Imperial guards and officers. Now, the, the droid that they have is actually a droid from the Empire, that they've reprogrammed to be a rebel, which I thought was a really cool aspect uh, of the movie. Um, so uh, K2SO essentially uh, is, is awesome for a lot of reasons. Uh, one, it's a droid they reprogrammed and has some personality. Uh, so much so 
that the line that has to exist in every Star Wars movie, right? Because in every Star Wars movie, at least once, they've got a bad feeling about something. You can think mm -hmm. about that where that's happened in, in Star Wars movies. They gave the bad, I have a bad feeling line to K2SO. That's how important his role was in this movie that he has the, and in fact, they interrupt him. He says, I've got a bad, and the other two are like, no, stop, don't say that. Don't say that. We're inside. So now they've accessed Scarif. They're dressed up as Imperial Guards, and they're attempting to gain access to the backup facility, essentially to steal the backup tape. Now, what's interesting to me is no other access controls, I mean, there are some, uh, not to get too deep into the plot, but there are some, but really very little prevents them from gaining access to the facility. They basically, like others have done, you dress up like a UPS person, or you dress up like an Imperial Guard and an Imperial Officer, and you've got free range of the entire uh, facility, almost, almost, uh, and they're really not, not questioned. Now, they do reuse some biometric uh, uh, authentication a little later on in these scenes, um, but essentially, this is an impersonation attack. One of the attacks in the MITRE attack framework is, of course, access token manipulation. MITRE defines this as a... A, a, a vulnerability, not really a vulnerability, but a flaw or an exposure. Really, the things that keep me up at night about uh, Active Directory are the things that are just inherent to the environment that are abused by attackers. So in Windows, any standard user can use the run as command and Windows API functions to create impersonation tokens, right? I mean, that's essentially the run as command is you're impersonating uh, another user. This is fundamental, in a sense, to the way that Windows works and allows for functionality um, and doesn't require an administrator account to use the impersonation functionality that exists inside of Windows. Um, so one of the scripts that comes from Atomic Red Team, uh, of course, there there is code to uh, actually steal the token, right? That's the link to the PowerShell script there to do the token manipulation uh, is yet a separate script. But first, you would want to see which users were on your system that you might want to try to impersonate. Uh, and this little script that's right here is a little bit of a PowerShell script that will uh, allow you to list the users that you might want to impersonate on the system. Now, in Rogue One, of course, th they've got an easy, you know, the officers enter the ship uh, and they basically knock them out and steal their clothes, right? Uh, so it was pretty easy to know which users you were going to impersonate inside of Rogue One. However, when an attacker lands on your system, they're going to have to do a little reconnaissance to see which users are on the system and then execute the actual attack technique to impersonate uh, those access tokens, which is, again, a fundamental uh, part of Windows uh, and something you can test for in your environment, which, again, kind of goes up there with a lot of the MITRE attack framework are techniques, not necessarily vulnerabilities and exploits, right? They are techniques that are in use by red teams, pen testers, and attackers alike that we're like, these are really bad. People should really fix these. And now we have a framework in which uh, we can do that and test our environment against these different conditions. Uh, so again, this came from uh, the Atomic Red Team. All of this is open source, right? You can get to the entire MITRE attack framework freely and openly available. You can get uh, Red Canary's Atomic Red Team uh, as well, which I think you guys said um, that you were heavily relying on as well uh, as kind of a model to help implement some of these attacks to detect them, correct? Exactly. Yeah, awesome. I mean, that's uh, Red Team's been pretty much the inspiration for a lot of our real development so far, that and like Caldera. Yes, exactly. Yeah, and there, again, that's a great point. There are other tools uh, out there to uh, execute some of these attacks. Uh, Caldera comes from MITRE uh, is a good one. Detection Lab is a good one to set up to be able to test these not in your production environment. We did a technical segment on that on Paul Security Weekly. Um, and there's, uh, let's see, uh, Jabra came on uh, when he was at Praetorian and talked about a whole Metasploit framework and, and other tools that they produced so that you can do the purple team style uh, testing and test against these various conditions that are outlined in the MITRE attack framework. Now, there's a lot of great, I should also say, in these links to the MITRE attack framework, great write-ups uh, from the team at MITRE, I'm sure with a lot of input from security professionals in the security research community to describe the various types of attacks of token manipulation, a lot of great resources. It was nice for me to see all of this, right? Because again, these are the things we're talking about going, people really need to lock down Active Directory against these techniques. 
Um, and it kind of gives that marriage in a little context, a lot of context actually, between the stuff we've been saying for years and the things that we actually need to fix and how you do that. So it's mm. really awesome. Um, Malicious Insiders, again, we did a whole webcast on the insider threat. Um, Malicious Insiders will also use covert channels as well. A lot of covert channels and communications that attackers would use are in the MITRE attack framework. There's an, actually an entire category for that. Um, so uh, it's kind of, kind of interesting. Again, the droid in the movie is a, an Imperial droid, but um, he, it, it, they've programmed him as a rebel, and he walks onto the planet, um, and, and Jin Erso uh, shoots him. And the droid's like, D did you know that was me? Kind of some more like impersonation going on. And, and, and that's kind of telling. You could do, draw a lot of security conclusions to that. You know, if you're doing any kind of offensive countermeasures or blocking or whatever, you're blocking a good guy or a bad guy or a bad guy that's flipped flip good guy or, or what have you. So um, Galen Erso uh, is the main, one of the main uh, plot points in the movie Rogue One. Essentially, Galen's one of the lead designers of the Death Star. Uh, and is kind of forced by the Empire to do their evil bidding and continue designing uh, the, uh, the Death Star. Um, and what's interesting is Galen's actually a malicious insider uh, inside the Empire. Uh, Galen doesn't want to participate in, in building a weapon of mass destruction and uh, builds a vulnerability into the Death Star, which is why the Rebels need the plans, which is how in the first Star Wars they realized the thermal exhaust port is the way that you blow up the Death Star. Because all good Star Wars movies, they blow up a Death Star, right? Mm -hmm. um, but he did, he sent transmissions, uh, a transmission to the Rebels. So while he's working for the Empire, Empire doesn't know that, that he's really working with the Rebels. Uh, I in that time, Galen sends a transmission to the Rebels uh, about this vulnerability letting them know that there's a vulnerability. So this, this transmission is uh, in included in the movie and uh, there, there's some further dialogue about it, but essentially there was a covert channel created for Galen to be able to uh, I inform the rebels of uh, what was going on with this vulnerability. Now, normally this story's a little reverse for us, right? This is a good guy inside a bad side organization right. communicating <laughs> right. to the good guys where normally we it's see flipped. it the other way. Right. <laughs> right. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. That's, that's a good point, Matt. Um, so uh, T1048, MITRE attack defines as exfiltration over an alternative protocol. Now, there's lots of examples uh, in this particular MITRE attack framework um, description. Uh, they define data exfiltrations performed with a different protocol from the main command and control. It's likely being uh, sent to an alternate network location from the main command and control server. Um, what I thought was interesting is uh, atomic test number four is exfiltration over an alternate protocol such as ICMP. Uh, and you can see this little snippet of uh, PowerShell code here um, that again comes from Atomic Red Team to basically emulate that attack. How do I send data inside of an ICMP payload to a server that's expecting it to then exfiltrate my data? Maybe even encrypting that data, right? We, we don't really find out in the movie if it was in encrypted communications or not uh, in the movie Rogue One. Of course, in the real world, attackers, you know, varying mileage as to whether or not they'll use encrypted communications. Uh, much of what's seen in the past, largely this would just try and be sneaky, maybe not encrypted, maybe it would, uh, but sending the data inside of an ICMP packet, something we've uh, talked about for a long time, has been known way to exfiltrate data. Uh, again, which brings us to an, an, an encryption, right? Um, and what's interesting in the movie is there's like this moment of the uh, Empire goes into essentially incident response mode, right? They realize, oh crap, there could be an insider that is leaking our intellectual property. For example, the plans of the Death Star. Did they build a vulnerability in it? Now they're in full-blown incident response mode. They want to know what's going on. So... They send Orson Krennic, who's like your quintessential bad guy in the movie, essentially very kind of, uh, you know, overblown kind of character, um, always upset about something. Um, and uh, Orson goes to uh, Scarif, that's the, the firewall planet, right? Big firewall around the planet where they host their, their backup tapes, uh, and gets there and says, look, I want 
every dispatch, every transmission that Galen Urso has ever sent, and I want to look at it, right? So, like, basically, he's going back and looking at the logs and going, did Galen send communications? And if he did, what were those communications? And inside of those communications, were there the plans of the Death Star? And more importantly, is there evidence that Galen introduced a vulnerability into the Death Star? Um, I really hope that Galen encrypted these communications, right? Like, if you're rooting for the good guys in the movie, not every Star Wars fan does, and that's okay. But if you're rooting for the good guys in the movie, that you're hoping Galen encrypted these um, so that if Orson does find these, uh, there'll be encrypted communications of some kind. Now, uh, Orson's under great pressure from, like, the world's worst boss ever, and, and this is one of the few scenes with Darth Vader in the movie, who says, right, I expect you not to rest until you can assure the Emperor that Galen Erso has not compromised this weapon in any way, right? I mean, your minds can just run wild as to how your manager would communicate this way to you uh, and refer to maybe your CEO as the Emperor, right, <laughs> in his communications. There's some force choking that happens during the scene. I mean, pretty much solidifying Darth Vader as basically the world's worst boss uh, mm -hmm. ever. Uh, so Orson's obviously under a lot of pressure to review these communications. Um, so in the MITRE attack framework, there are uh, specific T1022, is data being encrypted and exfiltrated in order to hide information that's being uh, exfiltrated from your organization. They provide some examples as to how attackers could, uh, or malicious insiders could encrypt data and send that out. Uh, and they document that, and that's, of course, something that you can look for in various ways inside of your network system logs, network logs, uh, and what have you to see if uh, that is, in fact, uh, occurring. Let's hope that uh, GPG uh, is around in the Star Wars universe, and that's what Galen Erso was using to send his communications. Um, so that concludes kind of the, the narrative with, uh, you know, Star Wars uh, Rogue One and how they map back to MITRE ATT&CK framework uh, specific items. Uh, I want to turn it over to Brian and Dan from uh, Logarithm to talk about how now you would go look for that in your network, right? Obviously, I think uh, the Empire is kind of, obviously it didn't work out so good for the Empire in their forensics investigation. If you follow what happens after Rogue One, it doesn't end very well for the Empire. Yeah. So Brian and well, Dan, over you. to you. Have to make sure to watch Rogue One tonight. <laughs> That's it. And now you want to go watch it again, right? That's yeah. yeah. Exactly. Well, thanks. Um, before we go into specific uh, detections, we just wanted to give a little bit of introduction introduction as far as what's been going on with MITRE lately, and address the the topic you brought up as far as you know the MITRE attack matrix or the, or the framework is getting so huge. How do we you know approach this as a company, or how do you how do you get started with it? Um, so. We go to the next slide. This is just um, <clears throat> in April of 2019, um, MITRE came out with an update to MITRE ATT&CK. And the numbers aren't quite as important, but just to get an appreciation of the scope of it. Um, so they, they brought in a whole new uh, uh, tactic called IMPACT, which covers 14 techniques. Um, there's seven new techniques across several tactics, 11 techniques updated, eight new groups, and so on and so forth. So. It's just to illustrate the point that uh, MITRE attacks and moving target, it's always going to be evolving and always changing. So in this case, you need to prioritize which, uh, which uh, techniques you need to focus on, uh, focus in on. So that's when we went with Red Canary, as far as like they published a top 10 of what they observed recently uh, as to what adversaries are using. And that's what we focus on as far as being able to develop our techniques to be able to put into the product. Um, but within your organization, uh, you would have to prioritize based upon possibly, you know, what kind of log sources do you have available to you, any kind of gaps that may have been revealed during a pen test, or even what kind of adversaries are focused in within your, uh, or, or focused towards your company. You know, if you're a, a defense contractor, uh, you'll definitely be, uh, probably a targeted a lot more so than maybe the bomb and pop that has a uh, uh, just a local five and dime store. Or if you're the empire, you need to, you know, pay attention to the, uh, the rebels. <laughs> anyway, I just trying That's to, right. that to that, I mean, that is their, their primary threat, right? So they would, they would focus, hopefully they were listening. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, 
moving on, I mean, as far as, you know, again, the first point of reality check, um, which, you know, which log sources are you collecting and which techniques require which types of data sources? Um, it's, as you'll see, if you just go to the MITRE ATT&CK website and start clicking through to start consolidating this data, it gets pretty cumbersome after a while. So we just wanted to bring up the fact that um, you can access um, ATT&CK programmatically or through the command line. Um, there's Sticks Taxi feed that you can use, um, or there's some PowerShell utilities. A lot of these are out in GitHub, so they're free, and you can just download them and take a look at them. But and there's some examples along the bottom here. So Posh Attack or the Attack Python client, um, or do it yourself using Python with the the um, the Sticks library. Um, so you can use this either if you're doing an assessment of the attack matrix, as far as you know. We know that we're not connect, uh, for example, we're not collecting endpoint logs. So these techniques we'll have to put aside for now. Mm. We'll have to focus on you know, IDS-based uh, uh, detections and so on and so forth. Um, or if you've got SOAR in your, in your environment and you wanna do some automation, uh, you know, so for example, you detect uh, an attack technique being executed and you want to query um, you know, attack for more information or for contextualization, you can do that here. That's awesome. And so this is essentially using sticks and taxi to find it in your logs, essentially. Well, this is using sticks and taxi to analyze the matrix itself. So yeah, it can answer questions like, um, you know, how many of these techniques are correlated with this um, or which of these techniques rather are correlated with this, this certain ABT group. Um, if I've got, you know, um, command line, uh, uh, auditing or, or logging happening, which techniques can I detect and that kind of thing. So it can be used for analysis or if you want to just automate pulling in contextualization, you know, contextual data from gotcha. the MITER, you can do it that way. Awesome. And would you use that to help prioritize some of the activity that's going on within the environment? Because does that play into your prioritization scheme then? Yeah, exactly. I mean, if you're, you know, again, if you're in a certain uh, uh, industry or a certain sector and you know that certain APT groups um, are interested in your sector, you can query attack matrix through Sticks Taxi and correlate that APT with the techniques that they're, they've been observed to use. Uh, this is something that uh, Dan did uh, as far as being able to just demonstrate it on how you can pull the information. Yeah, so this this is just an example of using Posh Attack, and essentially what you're saying is pull, show me all the techniques that require um, process or recommend rather process command line parameters as a data source. Awesome. Yeah, and it, again, the first thing you'd want to take into consideration is am I logging all of that command line uh, activity? If I'm not, this is what you're missing out on. If I am, here's what you can correlate it to. Right. Right. Exactly. Yep. So it's kind of, it's actually going to help you in, in a couple different ways. One, looking at the data you're collecting and really knowing which techniques you can actually test against, but also identify gaps of what you're not collecting that lead to other potential um, uh, attacks and techniques. Right. Definitely. It allows you to focus in on what kind of log sources do you need to put out there. Uh, logging the endpoints is really huge on the MITRE ATT&CK framework. Mm. Uh, most of the um, uh, techniques uh, look at command line processing, for example. So if you aren't logging your endpoints, of course, you're going to have a major gap. Yeah. One, of, one of Paul's four magic quadrants. That's right. Mm -hmm. Got to collect logs and you got to collect uh, data from your endpoints in the form of logs or however you get that information of what's happening on your endpoint, right? Exactly. So this is, you know, about finding about what you have in your environment. For example, at Logarithm, uh, it's easy enough to do by running a report uh, where you can see all the different log source types and the volumes around them. Uh, you can see from here, we took the information into Excel just to quickly pivot off of it and see. And from here, we can uh, tell from this list on what kind of uh, techniques we should be focused in on based upon the logs that we're pulling in. Yeah, a lot of Windows event logging data there. Yeah. So this report will kind of give you a gauge as to where you need to go log more to fill in gaps and also where you can look and cross-reference the MITRE ATT&CK. Definitely. Absolutely, yeah. Sweet. Um, so this, 
you know, again, you know, we, we see from a, a lot of our customers or just we hear from the field that a lot of customers aren't logging at the endpoint. Um, and if you're, you know, if you want to start um, attacking, well, not attacking, like bad choice of words, <laughs> but if you want to start um, approaching the MITRE framework and building detections around that framework, you might decide to start collecting at the endpoint. So this is a great opportunity for you to really dig in and start comparing log source types. Um, so, you know, this the message here is a little bit vague, but it, basically what it's saying here is no log source type is optimal for every type of detection. So we're just giving an example here in this table of, uh, you know, we, we would set up a test box, we would log the same sequence or the same simulation and have it collecting logarithm Sysmon, Microsoft Sysmon, and Windows Security auditing um, all against the same set of, you know, actions. And um, you can see from this chart here that in this case with process starts, uh, Microsoft Sysmon is what shines the most because it's got the metadata, not only the process name and the PID, but also has the, process, the, the parent process ID, the command line parameters, and the hash, which we, you know, lean on the hash in a few of our rules. Um, and the process path. Um, so, you know, for this certain event, uh, Microsoft Sysmon really shines. You'll find though, if you go into other detections like around file monitoring and that kind of thing, you know, window security might be better. So there's not a, a clear answer here, but, you know, again, we just want to say that if you want to start collecting at the endpoints, it's, it's, it's time, for, you know, it's an opportunity for you to really dig in and see what metadata each one of those log source types is, give, is giving you. Yeah, I don't think the you should look at this slide and go, oh, my answer is I run Microsoft Sysmon and I don't have to worry about anything else because they're all right. bypasses for Microsoft Sysmon. Sure. Uh, some really interesting evasion techniques we featured on the show. Carlos Perez actually was one of the, uh, was the person who presented that uh, on our show. And so by collecting from multiple sources from the endpoint, if an attacker is trying to evade Sysmon, let's say, uh, you're increasing your chances that they're going to put something in some other log that they either didn't think to overwrite or is a lot more work to come up with some kind of evasion that might not be worth their effort, and they're just hoping you're going to miss it, right? Right. Exactly, yep. So now we'll get into some of the detections we do. And we're going to cover masquerading uh, connection proxy exfiltration over our alternative protocol, which we talked a little bit about earlier, right? Uh, Drive-by compromise and service execution. Sweet. Yeah, and just to give it a little more context, so, you know, this um, spring we uh, released our first version of our MITRE ATT&CK module, and it's just going to be a collection of detection rules that comes um, out of the box if you're a lot of them customer. So we've got, right now, we've got maybe about 26 detection rules and and so we've, we've got a long path ahead of us <laughs> but uh because we want to have one rule per technique mm -hmm. uh so uh we just wanted to share some of the work we've been doing thus far and and just show you what our approach has been sweet yeah so let's get into masquerading uh masquerading the tactic of course is under defense of asian and the definition per MITRE is masquerading occurs when the name of a location of an executable, legitimate or malicious, is manipulated or abused for the sake of evading defense and observation. And detection, of course, is collect file hashes. File names that do not match their expected hash are suspect. So on this one, we're heavily relying on Microsoft Sysmon and, uh, because it does record the hashes. Mm. Yeah, so um, as far as, you know, uh, Part of our process is we always try to find either a simulation or actually just execute the technique um, in a lab environment. We, you know, observe the logs that result from that, and then um, we'll form our detection hypothesis based on that. So in this case, um, we we based our detection on uh, the simulation here. It's an atomic, you know, red team test, and essentially all you do, you can see pretty clearly what's going on here. Someone's copying cmg.exe out of the system32 directory copying into the, uh, the, the temp directory, renaming it lsast.exe, and then executing it. And essentially, this is just trying to bypass, um, you know, if you've got a very narrow detection where you're trying to look for cmd.exe, you're seeing that that's easily evaded, the detection that is, by just copying it and renaming it. Uh, and uh, PowerShell is also a pretty popular one that uh, attackers and red teamers will rename to evade detection. I mean, and that's a pretty yeah. basic, you know, technique, but you have to make sure you're accounting for it, right? Correct. 
Yeah, so in this case, um, basically the detection approach we went with is being able to whitelist everything within system root uh, and being able to then use this uh, whitelist of hashes uh, within the logarithm product to be able to compare against. Uh, so here, um, of course, looking at the file hash uh, for our command, uh, you can see that, of course, renaming it uh, is the exact same hash. Gotcha. In, in logarithm, you'd automatically check for this, right? Like, basically, if there's a Windows system file <clears throat> that exists somewhere else that has a hash of a Windows system file, you'll, you'll alert on that. Yeah, if you go to the next slide, you'll, we'll, uh, we'll show you the rule we came up with. I mean, this one takes a little bit of work up front. Um, essentially, there's a, that single line of PowerShell right there will um, give you all, dump out all the hashes of everything in the system root system 32 directory into a text file. And then you can just pull that into a list into logarithm. Um, the rule's a little bit difficult to see. I don't know if you can zoom in on the rule in the lower left corner a little bit. I don't think I can. I don't if, think I can zoom. If not, that that's yeah. fine. But essentially, what we're saying is, if we see a process execute outside of system root that's got the same hash as something in system root, to 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 fire. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Uh, yeah. So I mean that you know the our AI engine can do some learning around this, but we figured the the most exacting approach would be take like a golden image system, dump out the hashes from there, and then make that be your I guess your golden list of hashes. Yeah, and that 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 links into a question from the audience. Are the detection rules using uh, are are they based on your common event logging or your AIE rules? Um, so you did talk about your artificial intelligence engine a little bit. Are these are these common or are they are a combination of both? Um, well, the, the detections I'll be showing you are all based on our um, our correlation engine, how the AI engine. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, because they were asking if they were just common event logs or if they were um, artificial intelligence in generals. Yeah, in this case, the common event. So uh, just to give some context, if you're a logarithm customer, um, when we collect logs, we add a lot of metadata to them. Um, and part of part of the metadata that we add is something called a classification of a common event. And a, and a common event is, well, it's a common <laughs> description of what's happening with the log. Uh, in this case, the common event is a process start. Um, so that's what the common event is. Uh, but the, the correlation engine is then what compares the hash of the process that started with the whitelist that we came up with, or that you come up with. So common events would just be like a, a straight pattern match, like am I seeing this event? Uh, but the AI engine can uh, provide some uh, intelligence and correlation to the rule. Correct. Awesome. So now we're going to the connection proxy. Uh, the tactic is under command and control. And the definition for MITRE is the connection proxy is used to direct network traffic between systems, or act as an intermediary for network communication. And so detection is a process utilized in the network that do not normally have network communications or have never been seen before or suspicious. So uh, Dan actually tested this one using uh, HTREAM, which is one of the software uh, utilities uh, pointed to within the MITRE technique. And that's why we chose HTREAM. Yeah, and, and what HTREAM is doing, basically HTREAM is just a utility you're, you're able to set up a, a connection proxy. I mean, so what you're seeing in the screenshot below is um, you start up the HTREAM process on a machine. It sets up a listener on a, on a given port, and then um, another machine can connect to that port and proxy traffic through to a different uh, destination. Cool. Yeah. So in this example, uh, I mean, it's pretty straightforward, which is you're using HTRAN to communicate between an internal segment and outbound to the internet. Yeah, and just to give a little more background, I mean, that's, the, the use case here is, is, is an adversary has um, compromised the machine that's, that has access to the internet, and then they laterally move into maybe a more secure segment that doesn't have access to the internet. So they want, for example, like traffic to flow from that more secure subnet through to the internet. Um, so they set up a listener on the less secure subnet on that proxy the traffic. Yeah, or, or I don't want to trip a detection rule that, you know, my process is communicating to something on the internet 
because that puts all of the detection like in the same process on the same host. But what might look more normal is if my uh, one system connects to another so system internally, and then that system makes a connection out to the internet, and there's nothing malicious on the system or uh, indications in the logs, right, that that system maybe has been compromised uh, to evade detection. Oh, definitely. Yeah, I mean, you, you don't really need necessarily an extra utility to pull this off. So, yeah, you yeah. wouldn't miss through the malware. So here, and again, it's probably a little diff difficult to see, but basically what you're seeing here is an AI engine rule. It has two log observed blocks that are correlated to each other. Um, it's based on the, the Sysmon event ID three, which means that a process has made a network connection. The first block says that there's been an inbound connection to a machine um, from an internal host. So within the same, within your organization, essentially, a connection is being made from one host to another. Um, the second rule, oh, sorry. The, the, the second rule block says that that same process that received a connection from the internal host, it has now turned around and made an outbound connection to the internet. Got it. So you're looking for the lateral communication move and then the outbound to a potential command and control. Yeah, and this, I mean, this kind of takes advantage of another piece of metadata that's added to our logs, and that's the direction of the traffic. So, I mean, you, part, of, part of setting up the SIM is declaring which subnets are internal and, and, and which ones aren't. Yep, got it. All right, well, we'll cover exfiltration over alternative protocol. Uh, so this we touched on a little bit earlier, so I'm using the pin command to do an exfiltration, right? Um, and so on, mm -hmm. on the tactic is exfiltration. Uh, and the definition for MITRE is data exfiltration is performed with a different protocol from the main command and control protocol or channel. And of course, the protection is analyzed network data for uncommon data flows. Uh, for example, a client sending significantly more data than it receives from a server. So in the Red Canary test, um, we chose the um, uh, test uh, number one, uh, primarily focused in on using SSH. And in the earlier uh, screenshot that Paul did, of course, um, use ping. And so there's a slight difference on kind of like the detection uh, capabilities as far as like what we observe, because ping response is the same data, data amount that uh, sends is received. Whereas SSH, we definitely observe less data being uh, sent uh, uh, and then being sent out. So it's, it's just a different type of technique uh, test, um, but that's why we focus it on SSH one versus ping. Yeah, so uh, when we, Paul, when we saw your slide deck this morning before mm. the, the webinar, we had, I had a bit of a heart attack because <laughs> <laughs> this, uh, the rule that we came up with probably wouldn't detect um, the example that you showed of, of the XFIL over ping. Um, so this, um, just to explain, so basically what our detection was around is, is learning, having the SIM learn which of your applications are more outbound prone than inbound prone, or sorry, the, the, the reverse, more inbound prone than outbound prone, and then alerting if there's more out, outbound traffic on a session um, for that given protocol, if that makes sense. So basically what you're seeing, what this screenshot is showing you is, um, is, it, is an analysis of traffic in a test network that we have um, based on the logarithm netmon logs. And essentially what we're doing here is consolidating data over a week's worth of traffic. Um, the Netmon product really breaks down um, uh, data into specific applications. So you won't just see like HTTP or, or, or um, SSL, you'll see like Google, Facebook, and so on and so forth. So it really breaks it down into every site pretty much in a specific applications. Um, and so what the spreadsheet is showing you is certain, by, by analyzing the data, we've determined that certain applications are more outbound prone than inbound prone. Um, and then <clears throat> looking at this further, um, you'll see, for example, uh, SSH is more inbound prone than outbound prone. But on the right side, we've got a single session where there's a lot of outbound SSH traffic. So that's kind of the spirit of the rule as we're trying to find these outliers um, for specific applications. And now logarithm sysmon 
is what's installed on uh, the endpoint and logarithm netmon is you know, getting a mirror of the traffic or spam port and looking at the network traffic, correct? Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, you end up with like smart flow logs from, mm -hmm. um, or, or packet for full packet captures from Netmon. Gotcha. And I mean, if you were to look for ICMP traffic, right, that has payloads over a certain amount of bytes, you'd probably pick up on anomalous traffic. I mean, in general, ICMP packets aren't that, you know, they're not carrying a 1500 byte payload by default, certainly. Uh, and that in and of itself could be anomalous. Yeah, we have a couple of DPA rules that look specifically for that type of traffic. Mm. And so it'd be equivalent to the kind of like a snort rule where it'd be looking for unusual ping traffic. Right, yeah, that would pick up on it. Now, yeah, so this rule... Go ahead. Sorry, I was going to say, this rule is set up to say, if I see more outbound traffic than inbound traffic, I should probably set off an alert. Can you also look at the – here you, in the spreadsheet, you've got percentages, right? You see kind of the, the range of how much inbound versus outbound. Are, can you set ranges then to when things get out of expected or, or observed ranges that it can also alert as well? Because you might see things shifting over time, which could mm -hmm. trigger something before maybe it flopped the other way. Yeah, I mean, our engine can do statistical analysis like that. And and actually, if you go to the next slide, we can dig in a little more how we determine this. Again, is this kind of hard to look at? Um, but, I mean, first of all, if you just look at how it's kind of graphically represented, that cylinder thing on the right side is supposed to represent the baseline. So what this rule is, is saying is on a per application basis, um, over seven days um, accumulate how much inbound and outbound traffic is occurring. And then the, the rule logic is saying, um, if we see an application ov over a one minute period send out more than it receives, and that application in the last seven days has, has been inbound prone, in other words, it's always been receiving more than it sends, then to alert. Mm -hmm. so, so our AI engine can do that, that type of analysis. Right, because SMTP servers are the ones you're going to be like, yeah, it's normal for it to send out more, typically maybe than it receives, depending on what type of uh, you know SMTP uh, relay you've got going on. Um, but also the number of connections, right? Uh, when I used to do the analysis for the university, right, our SMTP server made a lot of connections out to hosts on the internet, and that's what you basically kind of I would manually whitelist. The AI engine takes care of that for me as like that's just that's normal. Right. Yeah, I mean, if you're in a highly known environment and you already know what shouldn't be outbound bound, you, that'd be a much simpler rule. But this is trying to do some of the learning for you, some of the baseline for me, yep. for you. It's perfect. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, and we'll cover drive by compromise next, where the tactic is uh, initial access. And of course, the definition per miter is a drive by compromise is when an adversary gains access to a system through a user visiting a website over the normal course of browsing. And the detection, according to Meyer, is detecting compromise based on the drive-by exploit from a legitimate website may be difficult, and that's true. That's what we found as well in our testing. So also look for behavior on the endpoint system that might indicate successful compromise, such as abnormal behavior or browser processes. This could include suspicious files written to disk and evidence of process <clears throat> injection for attempts to hide execution, evidence of discovery or other unusual network traffic that may include additional tools transferred to the system. Uh, so in the next slide, uh, we didn't have any simulation tests available uh, to go with. And so we came up with kind of a rule logic based upon what we thought would be most effective. I go for it. All right. So basically, we're relying on detection malware via IDS or AV logs to determine whether or not something's malicious. So if you do a drive-by compromise, you're hitting that you know from your browser um, on an endpoint that may or may not be logged. Typically, most endpoints aren't logged in a lot of organizations. And so the only thing you're going to have to go by is an IDS type of alert that says that this is malicious, but it still hit the endpoint. Um, but if you are logging the endpoint, and that's what our rule is kind of hoping that you are, is that we're also then correlating that to see whether or not that file actually made it to the temp directory on your system. Uh, if so, then that's a good sign that it actually did evade all of the upstream detection or prevention systems and made it to your system and your antivirus didn't deal with it on the system. And so, yeah, something that you need to be able to do an incident response on. 
Absolutely. Yeah. And more and more, I've noticed attackers are trying to use legitimate websites uh, mm -hmm. in order to conduct their attacks, uh, even so much so uh, <laughs> something they'll be talking about uh, upcoming on some shows and webcasts is they'll target le legitimate websites, right? And I mean, these can be websites that really aren't, you know, it's like someone's personal photo blog or, you know, just even some random website that had an application on it before, but doesn't now, but it's been around for a while, right? So the IP address, the domain name, everything about it, like it looks good, but an attacker will compromise it because it's running WordPress or something easily exploitable. Uh, and then use that as part, just part of their attacks, not their whole attack, it's part of their attack. Uh, and this allows them to get around, I think, a lot of the filtering that happens today. Of course, uh, you know, malicious advertising is certainly a thing. Take out an ad, it runs on a malicious website. Uh, so this kind of thing happens all the time. No, definitely. And so um, our rule block here, again, kind of difficult to read. And because of which numbers. Oh, well, it's. It's, it correlates, it's again, it's kind of a correlation between two different log observes. The first one in the upper left, we're observing a log where a browser process like Chrome.exe or iExplorer.exe uh, creates a file in the same directory. And then the second block is um, the, I think it's the classification of malware. So, you know, again, we've got a lot of different logs. We try to normalize our logs so that you can say, hey, it's any malware log, regardless of the log source type, being mm. the AV or IBS or whatever. Or even a threat intelligence uh, rule data as well. Right. Absolutely. Sweet. And finally, uh, service execution. Um, the tactic is execution. And the definition is the adversaries may execute a binary command or script via a method that interacts with Windows services, such as the service control manager. This can be done by either creating a new service or modifying the existing service. Um, so detection include changes to the registry, command line invocation, um, and Windows events that correlate to uh, creation or instantiation. Yeah, so here we use the uh, break canary test uh, for being able to run this. Uh, and basically it's just using service control manager to create a new service, start it, and of course then to delete it. Uh, so it's really straightforward on that. And uh, on the next slide, uh, for the detection approach, we went about it multiple different ways. Uh, so the rule actually accounts for different log source types as well as different types of uh, ways to detect this, um, such as command line auditing, pre auditing, Windows event logs um, that come in, as well as uh, you know looking for the service creation and execution. So there's another technique out there called new service. This is new service. Execute, uh, this is service execution. So the difference is, of course, we're actually looking for the execution of the service. Uh, so we're, again, via command line, we're looking for like something like SE start, but of course, we're also looking for Windows logs of event ID of 7, uh, 1079, 735, and 736 to help uh, corroborate that it did execute. And what I love about all these detections in your, in your approaches um, is that I think it, attackers today much less rely on external third party kind of tools, right? They're using what's available in the operating system. And I think traditionally that's been very difficult to detect. However, today we've got great data, MITRE attack framework, right? And a lot of resources that are looking at basically a specific or not so, or a different use case for that internal tool that's different from the way that it would normally be used in your environment, right? And what this does is it makes the attacker's job so much harder, right? I can use tools that are on the operating system. I might even be able to use some of those successfully, but at some point I've got to use uh, locally installed tools, live off the land in a way that's going to trip a detection somewhere, right? And that's essentially what I, I see you guys creating uh, is making that attacker's job really hard to emulate actual user behavior because at some point they got to do something that a process, a service, an application, or a user just normally doesn't do and is going to stick out in your detections. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, in general, we try to detect the effect of the technique more than just the specific procedure of the technique when, when possible. Sometimes it's harder than others. Sure. But um, 
Yeah, so the rule logic here is, um, again, we're looking for multiple different log source types and all these rules are the same thing, which is you can modify these rules to be able to um, account for other log source types, such as like if you had carbon black in your environment or something else like that, you could add that additional functionality into this rule logic to be able to detect that too. Um, but again, it's looking for a lot of different aspects of these, um, of again, the, the service uh, being installed, but then of course the second rule block of being started. And again, because we're relying on multiple log source types, any one of them is all that is needed in order to detect this type of activity. Sweet. Yep. Awesome. That was great, guys. Yeah, I don't have any questions yet in the chat window. Uh, we, we covered the two already around common detection, common event logging in your AI engine, and then uh, Paul clarified the difference between Sysmon and Netmon. So I think we, we covered those unless somebody else has any questions from the audience. Yeah, I, I, I think that's great. I think it's a, a great way to monitor your environment. Uh, now having a pretty standard framework that, uh, you know, as Matt said earlier, it, it, it does a lot, right? It tells you what to look for and what you may be logging today. It tells you what you're not logging and completely blind to so that you can, you can do that uh, and, and sure up your uh, monitoring to then sure up your environment. Uh, and I see, I foresee a lot of spreadsheets and a lot of project plans, right, that are based off of, uh, it, you know, this material, essentially. Uh, and I encourage everyone who's a defender to take a look at this. Uh, I mean, you're not done. If you cover the entire MITRE ATT&CK framework, right, you're still not done, but you're right. in so much, so much better shape uh, than before, because I really, truly believe that it represents much of what we've been talking about in the security community as, look, as attackers, this is what we've observed as red teamers and pen testers. This is how we're getting in. And years ago, I, I noticed there was a, a really big mismatch between what uh, attackers and pen testers were doing that was very successful to basically go from nothing to domain admin in a very short period of time. Um, and the techniques that were used for that, I was like, these are techniques that defenders are having a tough time with because it's they just can't go apply a patch they can't just uh you know they can turn on logging but they you got to know what to look for right i feel like miter attack has really helped bridge or is bridging that gap between uh the attackers and what the community has been saying these are things you got to pay attention to and what uh defenders are looking for and it gives you a nice framework that you can bring to your environment to your administrators uh network administrators systems administrators and say look this is what we've got to be able to detect as even just a starting point, right? Uh, so I, I, I think this is a, a great conversation and I'm glad that I'm happy to see so many open source projects uh, mm -hmm. and so many commercial tools and combinations of the two, right? Uh, being used to help facilitate uh, the MITRE ATT&CK framework to, uh, to bridge that gap. One last question here on, on gap coverage. You know, one of the audience questions was, you know, when do you think, where are you from a coverage perspective in the, MITRE ATT&CK framework, how far can you get with, with the capabilities within Logarithm? Just give us kind of a, a coverage and, and kind of ex, expected coverage and because people are interested in knowing, you know, how much of the framework can you cover and, and when? Oh, definitely. No, I mean, our roadmap and our hope is to cover every one of the techniques and be able to identify them individually. Uh, that's going to take uh, months to do. Uh, however, our cadence right now is releasing new content monthly uh, and we'll just be hammering away at it and hammering out all the techniques. Once we get all the techniques hammered out uh, and at least available, uh, the majority of them anyway, uh, then we'll start focusing on the procedures aspect of it, which is kind of like combining the techniques into a cookbook format to identify potential um, adversaries. Yeah, and it's also, I mean, important to note that we've got um, other modules out there like the UEBA module and um, which looks for unusual user b behavior. Um, and so some of those rules in, in that module as well could trigger from existing MITRE techniques that we don't have in the MITRE module yet, but it just, it doesn't illuminate the specific technique. I mean, you, you'll know that, that something unusual has happened with the user, but it wouldn't you know, map it to T1013 or something like that. So, um, you know, there's other logarithm threat related modules that'll also detect some of those things as well. Great, which means for the audience, there's more to come. More to come. 
Oh yeah. Yes. Dan and Brian are very are very busy. There's 244 attacks. So yes. uh, as, as today until you know the next minor release where hopefully you know there's more. Um, it was my sense that they're working very closely with the you know the security community and security researchers to to make sure that they cover as many attacks uh, as possible. So Absolutely. it's awesome. Yep. I think we covered a m many of the kind of base. Like if you were to start, if you were to take these slides. By the way, all the everyone who registered gets a copy of the slides. Uh, and this was your starting point. I think it's a great starting point uh, for, for folks. There's some pretty common techniques that we've been saying for a while, like you need to sharp your defenses, so. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you uh, everyone for participating in this webcast today. Thank you to our audience for listening and watching. We'll see you next time.